All right, welcome everyone to CNS Connect webinar series. My name is Amy Smith and I'm the Director of Certifications for the BCNS and the ANA. And today I am joined by Allison Rue, who is going to share her expertise on practicing nutrition in California, a uh, practitioner's perspective on understanding the MNT laws in California. As a reminder, if you are a CNS, you can earn one CEU for today's webinar in our recently added category number five, which is going to be participation as a learner in a professional and structured education activity. This does not require nutrition content. So I'll put a survey in the chat towards the end of the webinar. Be sure to complete that to get your certificate for your, your CE for attending. If you have questions during the uh, webinar, please feel free to put them in the Q&A or in the chat. And Alice and I will do our best to keep track of those. You can also raise your hand and we can unmute you if you don't want to type everything out in the Q&A. So feel free to raise your hand throughout the presentation if you have a question. So let me tell you a little bit about our speaker today. So Allison is a CNS, LDN, and have her, has her master's degree. She's a clinical nutritionist who specializes in behavioral nutrition, specifically chronic dieting, eating disorders, mental health, and co-occurring gastrointestinal hormone and metabolic health conditions for those in recovery from eating disorders. With her background working in the arts and entertainment industry, Allison has special, special interest in working with artists and health behaviors. She is a co-founder of Nutrition Hive, a multi-state insurance-based functional nutrition group practicing practice offering weight-inclusive care to clients with a variety of clinical needs. Allison is also co-founder of Clinicians Incubator, which provides CNS supervision and postgraduate education for emerging nutrition professionals. And Allison also serves at, on the Credential Council for the BCNS. So thank you for joining us, Allison, and I'll let you take it over from here. Thank you so much, Amy. I'm so excited to be here and talk about one of my favorite topics, <laughs> practicing nutrition in the state of California. And without further ado, we will look at this and, and please at any point in time, if you do have questions, feel free to type them in the chat or raise your hand and I'm happy to stop and we can discuss your question. So as we get started today, just a disclaimer, I'm a CNS, I'm not an attorney. I, this is not an official interpretation of the law. This is not a substitute for legal counsel. And especially if you're practicing uh, with California clients or really in any state, you should probably have legal counsel review practice laws in wherever you practice. So get ready for a lot of fun um, California themed images today. Uh, we're going to review the requirements for providing MNT in California. We're also going to talk about how California defines MNT and where it actually applies to practice laws. And then we're going to learn and focus on how to apply these processes to getting a physician referral so that we can apply best practices to our nutrition care. So we're all familiar with this map, and I, I don't know how you all do it at the ANA. What a complex thing to keep track of. Um, and on this map, California is listed as green. And, you know, I think as we've all started to get to know the laws of all these states with individually, it, it how, I don't know how you keep it down to just green, red, and yellow. There's so many nuances and complexities here. So we'll be focusing on uh, the, the nuances of best practices in California for today, and uh, hopefully it will make a lot more sense of how we can increase likelihood of reimbursement for nutrition care for our clients. So generally, big picture, the California state law really only grants title protection to registered dietitians, and there is no licensure or registration requirement for providing nutrition care in the state of California. What that means, we don't have any kind of state board when it comes to nutrition practice. And so there's no board, there's no regulatory agency, um, and there's only title protection for registered dietitians. So essentially anyone can call 
call themselves a nutritionist in the state of California. And I'm sure everyone on the call probably knows that that um, if you live in California, if you work in California, uh, you know that there's probably a lot of people calling themselves nutritionists who don't have the the quality education that you all you all have, and um, sometimes that that can be a little frustrating for the healthcare consumer. And so uh, again, another reason for us at CNS is to utilize best practices when we're providing nutrition care. So spoiler alert, best practice when we're providing MNT in California. Um, and we'll go through looking at the, the written laws together with more detail. But essentially, if you are a registered dietitian or if you have a master's degree in nutrition and you have a physician referral on file, this increases the likelihood for reimbursed, uh, for nutrition care to be reimbursed um, and re reimbursed potentially by a health insurance company. It also um, a aligns with the recommendation from the law for best practice for providing MNT in California. Again, anyone can technically offer nutrition care in California, but in terms of trying to increase the likelihood of a client, you know, having a super bill that they self-submit to health insurance, um, that having the physician referral on file, you having a master's degree in nutrition, that will increase the likelihood of uh, reimbursement for their care. Again, we're going to talk through all that in a lot more detail. So how prickly is this law? Um, you know, again, there's no regulatory agency in the state of California. And because of that, um, I think that's why in our state, we see a lot of people practicing nutrition and as a nutritionist who um, might not necessarily have the kind of quality training that we all have as CNSs um, and that registered dietitians have. And so because of that, you know, I, I, have, I have not heard tale of anyone um, having any kind of um, consequence because of that. Um, and, and so, you know, the, the level of prickliness of this uh, law and, and is not necessarily extremely high, but it certainly is something I think as, especially if you work for yourself and have a small business, a, a private practice, we want to apply best practices as business owners and as healthcare providers. And I think th that we owe our clients the service of following laws that exist so that we can potentially make the care more financially accessible to them. That's, that's a value that I know that is really important to me. So in terms of the actual kind of prickliness of this law, that's one question, but it, you know, today we're going to focus on how to increase the, the likelihood of reimbursement for nutrition care for your clients. So MNT, it's what we all do, medical nutrition therapy. And I thought it might be helpful for us to look at the definition of MNT uh, by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So CMS, um, which if you attended a previous webinar uh, that I think was held in April about billing insurance and super bills, um, you may have learned about CMS from that webinar, or if you're already in billing insurance, you might be familiar with CMS. Um, CMS is who essentially we all turn to as healthcare providers to identify what our billing codes um, that we can bill for. And CMS defines MNT as nutritional diagnostic therapy and counseling services provided by a registered dietitian or nutrition professional, that's us, for the purpose of managing disease. And um, so again, this is if we're going to try to aim for reimbursement for nutrition services. We're managing a disease. And so how that might be different from, let's say, uh, nutrition coaching or nutrition education. I'll give an example. So um, in terms of how we say we have a client who has high blood pressure, very simplistic example here. And the nutrition professional develops an intervention and they identify, okay, your doctor's diagnosed you with high blood pressure. I've assessed your diet 
for uh, the presence of potassium. Your potassium intake is very low. I believe that we should increase your potassium intake to help your blood pressure. And then they develop potentially a meal plan, a recipe booklet, or some kind of intervention that will help the client increase their intake of potassium. Again, very simplistic version. Obviously, we do a lot more than that, but just trying to use a, a, a simple version uh, as an example. So the, the nutrition professional is the one who identifies we're going to increase potassium and we're going to do so through the diet. Um, and then that applies that to the diet of the client. Now that's different from when a physician diagnoses a client with uh, high blood pressure and says, I'd like for you to increase potassium in your diet. Please go see a nutrition provider or coach. And then the coach says, okay, thank you for the direction, doctor. I will give this list of potassium rich foods. And that's, that's nutrition education. So when we're the ones coming up with the direction, with the intervention, when we're adjusting the diet, uh, potentially uh, implementing supplementation, um, that is essentially coming up with nutrition interventions that manage a disease. And uh, according to CMS, that aligns with the definition of medical nutrition therapy, which is different from, you know, general, here are healthy supportive foods um, that align with what your physician has already said you need to do, which is more nutrition education. Both are really valuable things and uh, both play a role in the healthcare process for a client, potentially improving their blood pressure. Um, and, and so, when we're thinking about how can we help our clients potentially maximize the likelihood and increase the likelihood that they might get potential reimbursement for their nutrition service fees, um, you know, we can think about how we're providing MNT. And um, if you want to learn more about how to code that, you can certainly go back and watch the webinar from last month. So let's look at how California looks at MNT and um, how California's law defines the process of providing MNT. If you want to read the law, you'll get a copy of these slides, and this link takes you to the full text of the law. Um, and we're going to look at kind of the pertinent sections, and I've highlighted them for you. So the first few questions that we're going to explore is who can provide MNT in California and what are the circumstances under which MNT may be provided? Uh, again, spoiler alert, pretty much anyone can offer nutrition advice in the state of California. Um, there is only title protection for registered dietitians. So when we answer these questions today, again, we're going to answer these questions through the lens of what are the best practices for a CNS to provide MNT in California and uh, how, what kinds of processes and procedures should we have in place so that we can increase the likelihood of reimbursement for those services. So first we have section 2585 uh, subdivision E of the, the law. And essentially it's stating that reimbursement for nutrition care uh, may be offered upon a referral by a physician or surgeon, um, and that the only people who can provide reimbursable care um, are defined and set forth in the next section, which is either a registered dietitian or other nutrition professionals with a master's degree or higher in a field covering nutrition science. And it needs to be from a college or university that's accredited um, and that uh, the physician and, and or surgeon needs to refer to this provider. So again, we're, we all, unless you happen to be a registered dietitian, we all fall under category two of this definition. And what that means is, you know, potentially you're a CNS candidate and you don't have your CNS yet, but if you have your master's degree, you technically can start 
offering super bills and potentially even apply to be on insurance panels in the state of California. And you would just need to have a referral on file from a physician. Um, and that would allow you to provide potential um, re reimbursable nutrition care in the state of California or for nutrition clients. So um, I still think obviously it's important to get your CNS, um, even if you live and work in California. Um, but essentially, you know, we all would fall under category two. And that is what makes a nice distinction between potentially somebody who didn't go to an accredited nutrition program or doesn't have formal nutrition training, who is calling themselves a nutritionist in the state of California, providing nutrition care that on the outside might look really similar to what we're doing. Um, you know, I live in Los Angeles. I, I think it, you can't walk down a block without finding someone who wants to give you support for your gut health here. So uh, whether or not that person is a qualified healthcare provider, I, I think we all are. And so we fall under this second part of the definition and being able to, again, provide care to clients that might be uh, potentially reimbursed by health insurance is a, is a real value. And it does set us apart um, from someone who is just offering general wellness support. There's this other part of the law. And I don't know how many of you spent time looking at this part of the law. Uh, it's a wall of text. So we're going to break it down together. Um, essentially, this section of the law defines MNT in way more detail than the medic, the CMS definition, um, which I just find really interesting. Now, the nice thing about this wall of text is it doesn't actually say you can't do it unless you follow certain things. It just says you can do it if you follow this way, and it, and this is what would increase the likelihood again of reimbursement. So this is the this is giving us a nice template for best practices in the state of California. So again, when we look at this wall of text, it may feel really overwhelming, and um, we're gonna we're gonna go through and highlight some really important sections. Again, the second part of the wall of text is that it does say that the services described in the subdivision may be termed as medical nutrition therapy. So uh, probably really helpful if you're working a lot in California to be familiar with what California does deem medical nutrition therapy. So a few really helpful key places here is that, um, you know, that other section that we looked at. So first we looked at 2585, which said that with that referral by the physician or surgeon, a registered dietitian or someone with a master's degree can um, potentially provide reimbursable nutrition care. Um, but essentially, upon referral by a healthcare provider, uh, then that person would be able to prescribe dietary treatments, provide nutritional and dietary counseling, conduct an assessment, and develop and recommend nutritional and dietary treatments, including therapeutic diets. And this can happen in an institution or in private office settings. Um, the other section of this that I think is really interesting, California really goes into a lot of detail here about what MNT might be. Um, so it can go into detail about making modifications to the type or quantity of food and nutrients, um, you know, providing rationale for the modification. It needs to be documented in the patient's record. Um, and, you know, I think that's really helpful for us to know that this is how it's defined. And if we're doing this, then potentially we could be, again, providing um, proper coding on a super bill or potentially billing insurance. Looks like... Um, Okay, and then we get into the question of the referral. So the referral for medical nutrition therapy needs to be accompanied by a written prescription signed by the healthcare provider. So here we don't necessarily see the language of physician or surgeon. Um, we see healthcare provider, it's up here as well, um, detailing the patient's diagnosis and including either a statement of the desired objective of dietary treatment or diet order. So 
we're going to break down what this means for you. Cause I know I see a wall of text and I start getting really overwhelmed. Um, so I think that the, the the takeaways from this is that if you're interested in getting into the minutia of how California defines potentially reimbursable MNT, it's all here. And then if you uh, you know want to read the law, it's here, but we're going to talk about how to apply this. So let's talk about this referral. What needs to be on a referral? The referral, and, and this applies, frankly, in many states, and, and if you're providing M&T, especially if you're billing insurance, you're probably going to be spending time getting referrals. So we'll talk through kind of tips and tricks about how to get those referrals right now. The referral has to have the client's name. The referral has to have the client's diagnosis or diagnoses, essentially the ICD-10 codes, because that is what you will put on your super bill or potentially on the CMS 1500 um, if you're billing insurance. And if you want to learn more about that, go back and watch the webinar from last month. And in terms of who can come up with a diagnosis, it's somebody whose scope of practice allows them to make a medical diagnosis. And uh, I think that that is where some aspects of this law get a little murky. We know that it says physician or surgeon, which are technically the same thing. Um, but, you know, we're going to talk a little bit more and I'd love to just kind of have a conversation about what qualifies as a physician in the state of California. Um, but essentially someone who can make a medical diagnosis is writing on the prescription what the medical diagnosis is. Indicating the referral is for medical nutrition therapy, indicating that they are referring to you, your practice name, and it should probably have your NPI number on there. Um, and then you need their name, their signature, and ideally also their NPI number. Um, though, again, the, the law does not say anything about NPI numbers. The reason I'm suggesting MPI numbers is because, again, we're talking about best practice to increase the likelihood of potential reimbursement for nutrition care, and it does help to have the MPI numbers um, on the referral and then in your records um, when you're putting together your super bill or your CMS 1500. So... The process of getting this, you know, it can, the referral can be, at this point, it can be electronic where it can be, you know, potentially the scanned, you know, if you have it sent to you electronically, um, it can be also saved. Or if you have a paper referral, if you keep paper files, you know, it can be just kept in the client's file. A lot of times people will fax the referral over. You can then put it into the client's chart, whether it's a paper chart or you're in your EMR, it needs to be acquired in a HIPAA compliant manner. Um, so that means that it, you know, if, if you don't have HIPAA compliant email, you can't request that they send it to you through email. Um, we need it to be faxed or potentially uploaded to a HIPAA compliant electronic medical record portal. Um, it can also be, again, a paper file. If you're, if you're seeing clients in person, they can just bring you the piece of paper. You can scan it and put it into your EMR or keep it in a paper file. So I know a pain point here is how do we manage the referral process? And for a lot of you, you might be wondering, how, how do we go about getting this referral? Um, I think sometimes just talking to other healthcare providers and managing that process can feel a little intimidating. So we're going to break that down and talk through that and kind of, again, give you tips and tricks of how to navigate this. So the first option is that the client uh, requests directly from their physician. And so some, some clients are perfectly happy. They have a great relationship with their doctor. They might have a doctor that they see regularly. And this can be any physician, right? We all just saw the law. It just needs to be a physician. It can be a surgeon. So um, that means that they, maybe they see potentially a psychiatrist regularly. I work in behavioral health. So a lot of my clients might see a psychiatrist once a month, once every two months. That's pretty frequent compared to the frequency people typically see primary care, for example. So um, they might ask their doctor at their ne next doctor's appointment, or they message their doctor. Um, 
potentially they have a good relationship with their doctor and some clients are perfectly fine saying, yeah, I'll just ask them. Um, the other option is that you can retrieve the referral. So it's office to office. And we're going to talk through the process of that. So we will need a signed HIPAA release. And then the, the nutrition provider can request the referral directly from the physician's office. Whichever option it, you're going to pick for your process, and you might do both, you might offer both, the referral will then need to be saved to the client's file. So let's talk through how to do option one, where the client um, requests the referral directly. So during potentially the discovery call that you do, you explain the referral requirement and process. And usually what we, we do during our discovery call process is that, you know, I take the time to explain that this law does exist and that, you know, if they would like us to provide super bills and we do take insurance in our practice. So certainly if we're billing insurance, we do need to abide by this law to ensure increased likelihood of potential reimbursed care. Um, and I also follow that up with a summary in writing of what the referral requirement is. And so we need the language that needs to be on the referral, suggestions of how to ask for the referral. For example, message your doctor, call their office, and then the instructions on how to upload the referral to the client portal if the doctor sends it to the client directly. And make sure to put your fax number on there too, in case the physician wants to just fax you over the order directly. And then the client essentially connects with their primary care doctor or with their other doctor, whatever kind of doctor they, they're gonna decide to ask for the referral, and then they can just upload the referral. This is somewhat successful. I think that this is a process that um, sometimes works uh, well and fine for people who have um, the, the bandwidth to do this as a, a health consumer. And for some health consumers, this is, they've never done anything like this before where they've asked for a referral from their doctor. And, and it might actually be too many steps for them. And um, it might then be a, a barrier to getting them um, into nutrition care. So we uh, will talk about the other options of what to do if that's the case. Here's some sample language. Again, you're going to have the slides, but essentially um, we send to clients, you know, ask your provider to generate a referral for medical nutrition therapy to, and then it's your name or your practice name with no session num number limit listed. Now, the, the reason we say no session number limit listed is that some doctors are used to writing like three appointments or seven appointments. Um, we, we definitely got a referral once. So this is a very much like learn, learn from our, what we've learned. Um, we got a referral once from a GI doctor that said for three nutrition visits and this client, this, this client had, a IBD and an eating disorder. And there was very, you know, three sessions, we're just going to get, maybe get started. So we, you know, and they were willing to pay out of pocket for these sessions, but they, we wanted to be able to provide a super bill. So, um, you know, we were definitely going to be going beyond three sessions. The client was fine beyond going beyond three sessions, but because that was what was listed on the referral, that then impacts what we can do with super bills. So uh, we learned from that situation to request that there's no session number limit listed, um, especially when you're in a cash pay practice and you're predominantly offering super bills. So um, that's definitely a, a hot tip there. Make sure you say no session number, number limit listed. Um, and then referral for client's name to your name, your NPI number for medical nutrition therapy for what they've been diagnosed with. And um, that, that generally just giving them the sentence of what to have their doctor write. Um, there might be doctors who have never written a referral for medical nutrition therapy before, or they, they don't do it very often. So trying to make it as clear and 
and concise and simple as possible is really important. Um, and and again, there's little tiny nuances like the session number thing that um, might be little surprises. And you might find potentially in your area that um, you add other language or you just just in a way that makes sense. But this is generally what we what we use. I just want to check in and see if there's any other. There was questions. one question, Allison. Um, somebody asked if uh, what determines if an email is HIPAA compliant. Oh, what a great question. Um, so most e most email is not HIPAA compliant unless you pay um, for the email to be HIPAA compliant. So I'll give the example of uh, like a Gmail account. Um, a regular free Gmail account is not HIPAA compliant. Um, even a, a, if you pay for um, having like Google Workspace, it's not HIPAA compliant unless you sign a BAA with Google um, and you select the HIPAA compliant option. So there's usually an extra step um, in making sure that your email is HIPAA compliant. I've only gone through the process with, with Google, with Gmail. I, I'm not aware of the process specifically with like a Microsoft um, email account or anything like that. Um, so there, there definitely is an extra step beyond just having an email account. Um, and there are certain email providers that might not have a HIPAA compliant option. But again, just because your email is HIPAA compliant, that doesn't necessarily mean someone else's email is HIPAA compliant who's emailing you. So, um, you know, I think sometimes clients will just send the referral over email. And it's not like we can be like, this doesn't count because it's email. Um, they made that decision. Uh, we tend to request that it is faxed or uploaded through the portal. Sometimes clients are going to send it over email anyway, um, but it, that isn't necessarily HIPAA compliant on their end of the internet. Um, so again, just kind of best practice approach, uh, ask for the referral to be uploaded to the EMR, which will be HIPAA compliant, or faxed, um, which would be, a fax is considered HIPAA compliant, and usually your fax number is connected to your EMR. Um, so that, I don't know if that answers your question, but in terms of like how to manage the referral piece and HIPAA compliant email, um, I tend to be potentially overly cautious, uh, with how I use my email, um, especially even with coordinating care, um, like eating disorder care, we coordinate care a lot with therapists, for example, I'm never going to write a client's full name in an email to a therapist. Um, I'm going to fax the therapist, the HIPAA release before emailing them and saying, hi, can we schedule an appointment to coordinate care for, and then we just use initials um, in the email just in case, because you don't know what the email's like on the other end of the internet. So again, might be overly cautious there, but just trying to incorporate best practices. So hopefully that answers your email question. So let's talk about option two. So with option two, you have your discovery call, you explain the referral requirement and process to the client, you schedule the client for the intake, and then you send the HIPAA release to the client. This will allow you to coordinate care with their physician's office. We usually send it along with the intake forms as in our EMR. And um, I will sometimes even on the discovery call, ask them, you know, can you see that form? We just sent it to you. Are you able to see it? And then they say, yes. And I'm like, can you fill it out right now? And then that way they fill it out. And then you can jump on the process of faxing that release over to the physician's office, along with a request for a referral. And that referral request can be a, a simple letter that says, um, you know, so-and-so client is um, interested in receiving nutrition care. They shared with me that you have recently diagnosed them with high cholesterol. If you would be so amenable to provide a referral for MNT that uses the following language, and then you would go back and send um, essentially this sentence um, and your fax number to the physician's office. And um, and then we usually call the doctor's office and say, hi, we just sent over a fax. 
both a release and a request for a referral. Just wanted to see if you wanted any more information or if there's anything else we can do to assist in uh, you know, this referral. Um, and then usually the doctor's office will say, you know, they're, that they'll fax it over later that day or the next day. And that does happen sometimes. And sometimes that it involves some follow-up. And, and so having some kind of process where you're potentially calling a few times or sending over another fax, just requesting that referral. And then once you receive the referral, which will likely come via fax because you've been faxing the doctor's office, you'll just put it in the client's chart, whether it's the EMR or the paper file. And sometimes this can feel really overwhelming, especially to early career nutrition providers. And, and this happens all the time in a doctor's office, physical therapy, occupational therapy referrals, uh, referrals for other specialists. They are very used to navigating this and they are, you know, usually per really happy that a patient of theirs is interested in pursuing health. <laughs> so they're, they're typically thrilled to send a referral for MNT. Um, and, and, you know, often the doctor's fine just, uh, you know, writing it and then the office will fax it over to you. So I know this might feel sometimes a little intimidating, um, but, you know, usually they're, they're thrilled to have this happen. So there are some speed bumps, especially, I don't know why this happens so much in California, but I feel like a lot of people don't have actual doctors here um, that they might have like an acupuncturist or a midwife, but they don't have a physician. Um, and so, you know, if you're going to be providing MNT and you're trying to increase the likelihood of reimbursement and you're following best practice, then we usually have a conversation with those clients and say, you know, I think that you, you know, you have this health insurance. Let's, let's utilize your benefits as much as we can. And here's a list of doctors that even if you just go to the doctor to have a physical and, um, then we can at least get a referral from them on file and um, that might help ensure, um, you know, potential uh, for the referral. Allison, there was a question. Uh, Sarah Khan asked, can a naturopathic or naturopaths diagnose in California? Yeah. So again, I'm not an attorney. I'm not a legal expert here. Naturopaths are considered, um, to my knowledge, naturopaths are considered physicians in the state of California. They are recognized. They are licensed. Uh, the last time I checked, uh, uh, Tracy Lynn, did you want to jump in here? Yeah, I'm happy to jump in momentarily. I used to yeah. work for the American Association of Naturopathic Physicians, so I worked with NDs for quite some time. And California does license naturopathic doctors. They're not in, under the same practice act that covers physicians, and they can't use the title physician, but they are licensed to practice in California, and they have their own scope of practice. And I believe their scope of practice includes diagnosis. So um... Yes, they can diagnose and treat. Yeah. Um, where this gets really complex, I will say, is on the acupuncturist front. Um, because in California, acupuncturists are able to bill in some ways similar to a primary care provider, but they are not a physician. And so, um, you know, it is, again, I would recommend getting legal counsel here, but uh, I think best practice would to not potentially ha use a referral from an acupuncturist, even though some of them do describe what they do as primary care. Um, so that is one kind of sticky, sticky place um, that I know we've had to navigate. Um, we've and, got a couple of questions too, if you wanna take them yeah, right now. Yeah, um, sure. Somebody asked, does having a virtual practice in California decrease or prevent the likelihood of a client getting reimbursed? That's a great question. So we have had pushback on one super bill that we offered that had um, an out-of-state 
office listed and um, we do have an in we have a California office as well and so um, it is again best practice to use a California address um, for super bills offered for care in California to increase likelihood of reimbursement it is not required but it is probably best practice and that might be like getting a um, a virtual office. I'm going to, I, I, now I'm going to put on the, my other, I'm not an attorney. I'm also not a CPA, but I will say that if you end up having an, a registered office in California, that, um, you might end up incurring the need to pay some kind of tax bill to the state of California. So you would need to talk to your uh, accountant to decide whether or not you would want to incur that if you don't live in California. It's $800 a year. to. We, I pay $800 a year for the pleasure of doing business in the state of California, no matter how much I make in the state of California. Um, and so uh, that is something that you should probably talk to a CPA about before you make the decision to have a virtual office in the state of California. Awesome. Thank you. And then we have another question. Can you clarify if you need a referral for MNT or do you only need it if you want to provide a super bill? Good question. So, um, so I think again, for best practice, if you're going to be doing MNT, it does, it, it, there is some protection, um, in terms of making sure you have the referral on file so that a client, I mean, this is just kind of more as like a business owner. Um, so if a client later on goes, I learned that I could get a super bill from you and I really want one, but you don't have that referral on file, you really can't offer the super bill. So this is kind of like a, a best practice conversation. Um, but the way the law is written, it doesn't, you can see that there's there's no explained like repercussion for offering MNT um, without a referral. There's no um, regulatory board or agency. And so again, I think it's ultimately your decision about what risk you wanna incur um, as a business owner. Um, and it's not, because we don't have licensing in California, we're not putting our license on the line by offering MNT without a referral because that just doesn't, that risk does not exist in the state of California. Perfect. We have one more question and um, maybe we might have to have Tracy jump in on this one. I was told by a potential employer that they prefer that I not only have my CNS, but also other licensures such as LDN, which means that I need to get it from another state since California doesn't offer it, which would be correct because California doesn't offer an LDN. Right. Um, they're asking, does California offer an LDN? No, it does not. Which states can I get that from and how do I do that? I, I can answer that as a practitioner and, and, and share what I've done. Um, so I have my LDN from Illinois and it was a, a fairly smooth process. And, and so um, I think that that would be an option looking at a state like Illinois um, was, was um, pretty efficient and um, you have to renew every two years. Um, you, you know, you don't have to have an address in, in Illinois. You can use your California address. Um, and, but if you're going to be billing insurance in Illinois, you, you'll need an address in Illinois, but, um, but yeah, it was, it was pretty smooth process. And again, it's, that's such a funny thing for an employer to require because there's no licensing, um, to, to practice in California. And this is actually a sticky point for the dietitians too, because in other states where there is licensing, a dietitian in a hospital is able to place an order for enteral nutrition. They're able to place an order potentially for some kind of IV nutrition, like electrolytes or something like that. If, if someone in the hospital needs that thing, California, they can't do that because there's no licensing here. And, and so I, I think that, you know, I've heard from, from on the dietitian side of things too, that this law doesn't really, the way it's written, it doesn't really serve them in terms of all the kinds of jobs that they have too. Um, and at some point, maybe it will change. There's some pro, there's pros and cons to it. You know, I think we have a lot more options in terms of how we can practice in a private practice setting um, than other states like 
and I see Diane's question about needing to be a CNS to get licensed in Illinois. You need to be a CNS or a dietitian or a C, I don't know, but there might be another one in Illinois. Um, Tracy, yeah. you want to jump in on any of this? Um, in Illinois, they used to recognize CCNs and they have them grandfathered in, but they no longer will provide new licenses, <laughs> excuse me, to CCNs. But uh, there are a lot of practitioners, to my understanding, that get licensed in multiple states and the license or certification sometimes that those states offer is different. It's LDN, there's one pathway in Illinois, in Delaware, in Florida, in Maryland. Um, in other states, there are two pathways to two separate licenses with largely the same scope. So North Carolina, New Jersey, North Dakota, all with CNSs there would become licensed as LNs or licensed nutritionists. So it varies by state. And if you, um, Tracy and I can, we'll put our uh, our emails in the chat. So if you have state specific questions, please feel free to reach out to us. We're not taking away from the California piece of the conversation today, but that's always, you know, something you can do is email us and let us know if you have questions about state specific requirements. Yeah. I think that was the last question on that piece. Great. I wanted to share a few other speed bumps that we've encountered um, just to help you all navigate these things. Um, the, um, you know, sometimes the physician requires an office visit before the referral. So, um, and, and sometimes the client wants to talk to their doctor before scheduling. So don't lose the lead, um, schedule the intake, even if they want to talk to their doctor first, um, or if they need an appointment with their doctor first, that might mean you're scheduling the intake for one to two months out. Um, that allows them to see their doctor, talk to their doctor, but at least they're scheduled, they're on your calendar. You send them their intake paperwork. Hopefully you're taking you know, some kind of credit card um, and, and you're getting them actually booked. Um, and then whether you're helping coordinate get in the referral or they're gonna do it themselves, that process can then get started and happen. And you know, if you have to reschedule the intake because they, they need to have another appointment with their doctor, make sure to keep getting the intake back on the calendar just in terms of process advice. Um, get it scheduled, keep it on the calendar, hold on to the intake on your calendar so you don't lose the lead, um, even if it's gonna take a little while to coordinate getting the referral from the physician. So. We just had one more question pop up. Um, I was under the impression that the vast majority of insurance plans in California don't even cover nutrition services. So it seemed like more trouble than what it was worth to offer a super bill. Is this inaccurate? And how many plans do cover nutrition? So I, I don't know if I have the complete answer to that question. I can only speak anecdotally. And I think that... Um, if somebody has an insurance plan that's a PPO plan through an employer, uh, they likely do have nutrition benefits. Uh, it is less likely if they have potentially a, a plan that they've purchased through Cal Cover California, which is our, um, our um, health insurance platform for the state um, that may have less likely uh, nutrition benefits as part of their plan. Um, but if they have, um, health insurance, that's a PPO plan through an employer, they likely will have nutrition benefits. And you might be surprised as to how much is covered. And, and it really also will be determined by what they're diagnosed with. Um, so I would recommend watching the, the insurance webinar from last month, because I think that probably goes over some of that. For example, I'll give an example. Um, Blue, so Blue Cross and Blue Shield are separate companies in California, whereas in other states, they're the same company. Blue Shield PPO through an employer, uh, the client's diagnosed with an eating disorder, they're going to have potentially unlimited benefits covered with nutrition, potentially, depending on the plan. Um, and, you know, they might need to meet a deductible first, they might just have a copay. It really depends on their plan. So to probably, you know, a lot of this probably depends on your specialty, who you see, and, um, you know, what, where you're located, who your clientele is. I had a cash-based practice in LA for years and people were 
perfectly happy to do private pay. And, and it, you know, at a certain point, I think that um, depending on your clientele, it does really help to, to be able to learn more about insurance billing. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. Um, I see a question about payment system that's HIPAA compliant. So if you're um, using an EMR for your payments, then that likely is going to be HIPAA compliant. Um, in terms of the way payments are processed, the, the, the requirements for HIPAA compliance with payments is a little bit I, I don't think that they're the same as the, our concerns we would have, for example, as the email question. Um, um, so I, I think that anytime you have a question about whether or not a, a service is actually HIPAA compliant, probably best to, to check with the service itself and read um, in their literature about whether or not they are actually HIPAA compliant. Um, I know that when I do my bookkeeping, I do delete client names um, before sending the bookkeeping to my accountant, if that helps. So um, I think that the, the, the payment question is really for the payment processor. Um, and I don't, I'm not familiar with, with what payment processors on their own use any kind of HIPAA compliant platform. But if you're charging through an EMR, then you're, you know, one, one thing about billing through EMR, if you're going to be taking HSA and FSA cards, um, you will need to typically have an, uh, there will need to be another agreement that you sign with your uh, payment processor so that you can actually accept HSA and FSA cards. And um, that would be Another reason to apply best practices with getting a referral um, for California clients, if you're going to be taking HSA and FSA cards. Okay. Um, generally, I would recommend to not offer a super bill or bill insurance without a referral on file in California. I think that's really important um, because it does just open you up as a business owner to um, potential financial dispute if something then isn't covered. Um, and the expectation from your customer, your client, is that they will have some kind of financial reimbursement. So we're very careful about how we describe the likelihood of reimbursement. All of these things are to increase the likelihood of reimbursement, um, but reimbursement is not guaranteed. Uh, so again, I think it's really important just to, to try to think about what are best practices for your clientele and, um, and how can you, you know, what are the steps that you wanna have in place to protect yourself as a business owner and um, be able to try to offer care that's more financially accessible potentially to your clients. Um, so I'm happy to answer more questions. Um, I did want to make sure you have our contact information. Um, we are accepting applications for um, our SENA supervision cohort uh, in September. They're due ju July 21st. And I just want to make sure everybody had my direct email. And this is my direct phone number uh, if you ever want to get in touch or ask any other questions. I'm going to stop screen sharing now. Thank you so much, Allison. I'm while everybody's if, wrapping up, they have any other questions. I put the CE survey in the chat and I'm going to put the link to the upcoming and recorded webinars in there as well. So the one that Allison has referred to a couple of times um, will be um, in the past recording. So that was uh, Liz did that last month. So feel free to check that out. So that website is there. Allison, do you mind putting your um your contact info in the chat. Uh, yeah, else. happy to. So I'm going to type it in there right now. So we have a couple minutes left if there are any other questions. Um, also, you can raise your hand if you'd rather just have me unmute you. Um, yeah, so I will send out the recording in the slides likely on Monday um, or on Friday. We'll see <laughs> what I have time to do, but I'll get it out to you early next week at the latest. Yeah, and again, I think that, you know, because 
we are essentially in the wild west out here where, where anybody can call themselves a nutritionist, that there is value in the, in making the distinction between I'm able to provide you, if we follow these, this process, I'm able to provide you with a super bill or potentially bill insurance. And I think that does set us apart. It is, um, it, it's a helpful way to kind of build your platform for your business. And you also have options as, and you can make decisions as, as a business owner um, that you have your business owner hat and you have your healthcare provider hat. And those are two different hats. And, and so you get to decide how you're going to reconcile those. Um, we had one more question come in. If you're working with someone from out of state, is insurance an option or will insurance only pay for a practitioner within the same state? <laughs> so typically you need to have an address in that state and you need to be paneled with their insurance plan in that state. Sometimes, and it is almost random as to when this happens, you are able to bill insurance. Say you're contracted with United in California and you have a United client in Texas. You're sometimes able to bill Texas United, but it almost is like by luck. It's not guaranteed. The Again, this is a best practice kind of approach supposed to have an address in that state and bill through that address for that client technically. So, and I, Tracy, you don't have to come back on camera, but I did put in the chat. I forgot to introduce Tracy. Um, Tracy is our director of advocacy and regulatory affairs at the ANA. So she is here to answer questions. Um, you're, you can always feel free to email either of us if it has, if you have any questions regarding uh, state laws or specific state requirements, and that's for CNSs and um, for CNS candidates. Um, Grace asked, even for super bills, are they considered out of network? Great question. So again, we you know for a while we had no problem doing super bills with an out of state address, and then we did get pushback from one. Um, insurance one client said, you know, my insurance plan said that if you had an in state address, they would be more likely to reimburse for the super bill. That was a California client. We had put our Illinois address on the super bill. Um, and so we just changed it to the California office and then that, that took care of it. So uh, it might happen. It might not. I, I, I think with insurance, um, once you get into how insurance works, you realize that it's almost like, I don't know, you're in an, an adventure action movie and the you're on a bridge and like the pieces of the bridge are falling and you're trying to hop across the bridge and it's different every day. So um, yes, it's a lot of work, but it does make the care more financially accessible for clients. And so again, you have to weigh the pros and cons as you're at, when you have your business owner hat on. Yeah, it's also a great way for new CNSs. I know when I first got my CNS, that was the first thing I did was apply, you know, panel with Blue Cross Blue Shield. And that was how I got clients to start with. It was a really good way for me to build my practice up. So, you know, it is a good option for, for new CNSs. Well, all CNSs, but especially new CNSs who are trying to really grow and, and you know, get, get as many clients as they can in the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. And and I'm also surprised. Sometimes I feel like explaining super bills is going to be hard for clients to understand. And with super bills, I think especially in California, at least in LA, a lot of clients are used to super bills. They're seeing their, their acupuncturist, their therapist, they're seeing their chiropractor and everybody does super bills. So don't shy away from saying, I can do super bills. You would have to submit it to your health insurance plan yourself. I, again, I know it seems like we're asking the client to do work, but many of them are perfectly happy to do so because they, they might get potential reimbursement. So definitely. All right. Well, thank you so much, Allison. This was, we had some great feedback in the chat that everyone really enjoyed it and loved the level of detail. So we really appreciate you taking time out of your day to share your expertise on the topic. And um, if anybody has follow-up questions, please be sure to let us know. And I will get the slides and the recording sent out in the next couple of days. Thank you so much, Amy and Tracy Lynn. This was so fun. Thank you for joining everyone. Have a good day. Thank you, Allison. Awesome.